Um, that's first and foremost. They want to know that you have an eye on that. Um, because I mean, one of the hardest things to do is if you don't know that risks and an agency tells you what it is. Yeah. I, I mean, that's not good. You, 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 they, that's basically them being like, Hey, y'all don't know how to do your job. Um, and when that happens, they do tend to dig really hard into kind of looking to your, to what you're building. Um, you know, you want to, you want to come out of the gate and show them that you are the experts at your own. Um, and unfortunately something I do see is a lot of people are pretty naive. They're like, we would never do that. Like I would never, like the amount of times I talk to FinTech people and I'm uh, like, well, what's protecting, you know, a rogue you know, team member from doing this. We would never hire someone that would do something horrible. Oh my goodness, no. Hey Stevie, how are you doing well? I'm good. How are you doing today? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm doing absolutely fine. Just shocked to hear the fact that India is LP too. <laughs> uh, so I, I think um, let's just get into it so I'll ask yeah. uh, you when you're when you're in college you had a professor who talked about sheep why <laughs> and what was that all about yeah okay so um, I I was kind of one of those people in college where I took I took all kinds of classes like my my parents were very much so Go to college and actually learn things. Don't go to college and kind of be like, oh, I only take things to my major. Um, I also had a ton of majors in college, but um, I had, I, I grew up on a dairy farm. I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. So I was taking classes of all kinds. You now, whatever. If it was a, a class and I enjoyed it, I took it. Um, that's how I think I'm pretty good at Jeopardy actually now. But I had a professor who, one of the classes that was like a required class was geology 101. Took geology 101, um, learned about some rocks. But one day we had a uh, professor come and talk. You know, he was not the professor who we normally had. Uh, he was like filling in and he was this older guy from New Zealand and he just talked about sheep all the time. And I fell in love with this professor. Like I was just like, I love everything he's saying. Um, for the next four years of my college career, I took every class that I could find that this guy, um, taught about And Like people were like, you love geology. I was like, no, like we would just sit there before every single lecture and just talk about sheep. I didn't know that much about sheep. We didn't have sheep on our farm. Um, so I, I'd be, I know a lot about geology now, which is kind of interesting because we also do some investing in like energy and I'm like, oh, well, I know about sheep. Oh really only because i loved his accent i loved his stories about just sheep i learned about how big of an industry um that like sheep are in new zealand like it I, I wish i could tell you that it was just i really was interested in geology no i just loved this man's stories and he made geology so interesting like i was enthralled so um Yes, I fell in love with geology through his sheep stories. So good job. I, I, I feel like everyone needs that one person that gets them really in, like really interested in and invested in things that you're like, I would have never cared about that or I would have never been excited about that, but you just made it so fun. Um, maybe hopefully I can do that for like regulated industries and like compliance one day, but like, maybe I can do that. But yeah, he was one of my favorite professors. So I, and again, wasn't a geology major. I was about to graduate and they were like, Oh, you, you could take two more geology classes and, and you'd have another major. And I was like, yeah, does he have any more classes? And they're like, no, you, you get them all. I'm like, mm, no, I'm good. Don't really, don't really care. <laughs> You should, you should make it your life's mission to find that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, he was pretty old, so I'm hoping he's retired. Like, I hope he's, like, living a life of leisure in, like, New Zealand, where he was from. Just, like, petting sheep, like, living his best life. Like, I hope, I, like, really sincerely hope that's what he's doing right now. <laughs> yeah, we need, we need more people like him. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Definitely. So, yeah. So I, how did the how did the thing about 
highly regulated market and VCs come over from rocks. No, are rocks regulated too? <laughs> Actually, so, uh, you know, energy really is, which most energy does come yeah. from rocks. Uh, so technically, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so how did this happen? I, I asked myself that. Actually, um, so I started my career as a lawyer. Uh, I did not actually end up being a veterinarian. I uh, I failed miserably at being a vet student. Turns out I don't like blood. Not for me. And a lot of blood in being a veterinarian. Um, so I decided to be a lawyer instead. And if you have a lot of blood as a lawyer, you're in the wrong kind of law, in my opinion. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I became a lawyer, um, ended up going to work, uh, for medical societies, Johns Hopkins, worked at a couple of, um, startups, started my own company, um, in the genetic space. Genetics was kind of one of those other things that I got really involved in, in college, um, and also, growing up in a dairy farm, they use a ton of genetics for cows. Um, so it was always an interest of mine. Started a genetics company. Um, you know, I had been doing a ton of angel investing probably since, you know, the time I was a lawyer. I did a ton of angel investing just because um, I got a lot of inbound from a lot of startups that were, you know, seeking legal help. Um, in a lot of cases, they probably couldn't afford what I was what I was asking what my what my hourly was put out by my um but my 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 firm but um it just I, I liked them I loved their stories um they were also excited so um you know I had been an angel investing for some time when I shut my company down I kind of fell into this like what do I really want to do what am I enjoying doing at the time you know, I had exited my company, so I had started really getting back into helping other entrepreneurs. Um, I loved that. I I loved helping them. I loved kind of, you know, steering them in the right direction in some some cases that were pretty important. Um, and I was honestly loving, you know, being able to diligence companies, being able to still do angel investing. Um, and I just thought about, you know, maybe this is something I should professionalize. Maybe I should actually be an investor professionally um it was honestly not something i had ever thought about doing before i i, I had pitched plenty of vcs at, during my time as a founder um and i had asked you know people had asked me before like would you ever be a vc would you ever be an investor i was like no nah, i would never do that they just don't think it's for me um and then i think i really got to thinking about you know if i start my own fund i can kind of make this something i like that i enjoy um, it makes sense for me to do and, you know, takes away some of the things that I don't really want to do and takes away some of the things that like, I, I don't think are a fit for me or my personality. Um, I, I tend to have a pretty, pretty hard and fast rule against assholes. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's definitely one of the things where I, I knew I was going to have to do it my way if I was going to do a fund. Um, and so started the fund and yeah, it's, it's going. Yeah. That, that's a great way of getting into investing. I think I, I, I've not seen this a lot. I know if this is planned or not, but yeah, that's a great way to get into it. I, I'm a big fan yeah. of just doing for what makes for the best story. You don't necessarily have to plan your life out. I'll, um, I think you end up where you're supposed to be and, you know, you do what you enjoy doing. I, I think if you, if you get halfway through your life and you're doing something that other people say you're good at, but you hate doing, like, I, I see this a lot in my friends, you, like, you, you can't keep it up. It's not sustainable. And so, um, I think everyone finds their, their place eventually. Should, should, should a lawyer really say that? I think lawyers might be uh be most uh qualified to say. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So uh, I think uh, yeah, that that's a good point. We'll get back to the lawyer part in a few minutes, but I I wanna talk about the regulation part, the highly regulated things. What is a high regulated market? Yeah. So I, I tell people we invest in anything highly regulated and then we get a lot of people who are like, What is that? What does that mean? Um, you know, for me, I think the easiest way to think about things that are regulated or like to think about if something is regulated is to think about 
is this area possibly capable of hurting someone, something? Can it cause, you know, someone to lose their money? Can it cause someone to, you know, manipulate the market? Like, is there actually the chance that something bad could happen with this? And so that's why highly regulated things tend to be like food, beverage, um, energy. Um, because of course energy encapsulates things like nuclear energy. Um, then you also have, you know, things like under, you know, underwater drill, like deep sea drilling, things like that. Um, then you have things like fintech finance, which people can lose a lot of money. You have biotech, um, healthcare, which are things where people could die. Honestly, like if you do things wrong in healthcare and biotech, people can die. Um, which honestly is kind of the same for food and beverage. Like not only could you possibly get someone sick, but you know, someone could die if you have a food or a beverage that is not formulated correctly or has something inside of it. Um, like think about all the, the times like people find weird stuff in their food. Like, yeah, you don't want to find like glass in your food. That'd be bad. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I, I explain like what highly regulated industries are. Um, you know, some other things like in insurance, um, because again, like you you do it wrong people aren't properly insured and they can lose their shirts they can lose the house they can lose everything um so that's really the over the over broad way of like thinking about is this industry regulated and how regulated is it um you know some things are really really regulated um because then you you get into things like cannabis you get into things like gambling um liquor things like that where there's like a, a much higher chance of Happening. Yeah, but uh, so why, why is it tough to build a company in these months? Yeah, I mean it's tough because essentially you can hurt people. Like you, things can go wrong, and in these industries, when they go wrong, they they tend to not go baby wrong. They tend to just go big bang wrong. Like just it's bad. Um, and a lot of the reasons for that is because if you make one mistake, they tend to spiral and layer upon each other. So one one mistake, one wrong choice, when you're building a company in a regulated industry can kind of cause you to just stack a bad decision on bad decision. And then when things have, you know, the opportunity to hit the fan, they tend to just be like, bad thing, bad thing, bad thing, bad thing, bad thing, bad thing. Versus, oh, we made one mistake. Um, we just need to, you know, redo something in our, our processes and procedures. Um, I, I think the bit, that's really the biggest thing is I think, um, I try and work with companies as early as I possibly can um, because I, the biggest thing I see is people will reach out to me when they're like a series A, B, C company and they're like, hey, we we ran into this regulatory issues. And basically you look at it and I'm like, bro, like your whole company needs started over from scratch if you want me to come in and help. Like you've literally made a company based on poor decisions. Um, and I think that's something that people just the compounded problems and regulated industries are really hard to fix if you keep going down the wrong path. Um, and so I do tell people to really seek out legal help as soon as like, they have an idea again, because like you don't want to compound on those problems and you do want to create a company that can kind of weather any kind of storm. Um, and so that's why you you do really want to talk to lawyers in the area that you're in pretty quick. Not just a startup lawyer, not just like a, a company formation lawyer, but like an actual lawyer for these regulated industries and like the one specifically you're in. Um, but there's a, I mean, lawyers, lawyers are expensive. Like lawyers can be really expensive. So you do have to find the right lawyer. Like you have to find a lawyer who um is affordable for your startup or if you haven't raised yet they're affordable for your budget you have to think about someone who is familiar with startups because there's also a lot of um regulatory attorneys that have only worked with like massive companies and like if you're like hey i've got a company too they're just like they're they're gonna they're not gonna know what to do they're gonna really they're gonna set you up for just a lot of confusion um so you need someone that can kind of help your your company scale um and, and I think the other problem is a lot of people when they're starting, instead of talking to lawyers, because the lawyers are expensive, they talk to other companies. They're like, oh, well, I talked to this company or that company that's in this space. 
Okay, we saw this a lot with crypto where everyone was like, I can do it because this company did it. They did it because this company did it. All of them were doing the wrong thing. So like they basically cut paste the same strategy and every company used it and all of them are wrong. Like, like it was basically like one person's bad choice became 50 companies' bad choices. Um, and I think that's something like there's really... You know, if you're talking to your peers, you're talking to your colleagues, you're talking to other founders, don't take anything like legal or regulatory as like gospel because the chances that they are just pulling it out of like their own experience, which is not your experience, is pretty high. And unfortunately, the chances that they've actually talked to a lawyer and vetted out their own plan also pretty hot <laughs> um i wish i didn't have to say this but like i the amount of times i've i've had companies come to me and i'm just like where did you get this idea and they're like so so did it so we know it works and we can do it and you're just like where did they get it and then they're like this company and that company and then that company and then you're just like great so you're all doing the wrong thing congratulations i hope you're proud of yourself <laughs> Yeah, uh, so sh should a uh, founder uh, invest in an expensive lawyer or something that fits their budget? Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. You do, I, I hate saying this because, like, you get what you pay for with lawyers. Um, if a lawyer is like, yeah, for $25 an hour, I'll give you legal advice, please, please, for the love of God, just run. Run the other way, like, they're, you're, it's going to cost you $20 million to fix something that they did later. Like, it, it might seem like it's a good deal. It's not in the end. Um, there are affordably priced attorneys, but again, bet them. Like, you need to really bet people. It, in the startup space, just in general, like, when you're talking to people, um, especially lawyers, like, ask for, you know, references from, like, other startups they've worked with or founders they've worked with. Um, get a lot of word of mouth if someone's like yeah i enjoyed working with this person they they they, they were a lot of help um that's a good sign if you get someone who's like oh i don't know anyone in this space you know um okay how did that happen <laughs> yeah so i would i would just kind of i would really tell people that like it is hard to pay for a really good attorney right away so you do kind of need someone in the early stages that's affordable so you have to kind of like, I'm not going to tell someone to blow all their money on attorneys. Like, I don't think that's that's not the end all be all. Um, I mean, that's partly why the biggest value add for our fund is I'm just like, let me do your legal work so you don't spend everything that I raised for you to just, like, give it to an attorney. Um, that's one of the hardest things, actually, is, as an investor who's a lawyer that you see is, like, I, I will I get so many pitches from companies and I ask about, you know, where are your big legal expenses? And you know, one of them once told me he was like, Yeah, well, we spend about twenty thousand dollars on like having our NDAs and like our contracts reviewed on a monthly basis. And I was just like, No, bad choice. It's like it was like that's twenty grand a month you could have, like for actual legal strategy and like legal needs. Um, you know, some things are not worthy of like a big law attorney. Um, and you, you know, learning what you should send to your big, like fancy outside counsel firm and what should be, um, you know, what a paralegal could do, what, um, a, you know, an affordable attorney could do is, is a talent that I think most, most founders have to kind of learn that the hard way. They get one, basically all founders get one huge legal bill and then they're like, what is it? <laughs> and then they learn. <laughs> yeah. A good, not a good, not a good thing, but yeah, you live and you learn. Uh, or in some cases you become Johnson and Johnson and you learn. Yeah. <laughs> and then you, yeah, let's, let's keep paying for more and more expensive lawyers. I, that's the thing that I always tell people is like the most expensive, expensive lawyer you can ever have as a criminal attorney or a litigator litigators and criminal attorneys are so expensive so if you guys have like a problem paying for a more expensive like regulatory attorney it's like 
yeah, if things go wrong, you're paying for litigators and you're paying for criminal attorneys. And at that point, just call yourself bankrupt like that. It's hard. It's really hard. <laughs> so at, at, the, at the seed stage, um, before before the company pitches to you, should they have their legal problem, legal things sorted out or is that outside yeah. the case? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it depends. If it, it depends on how far you are. Like, like I said, like I like to talk to companies that are very, very, very early stage, so that we can kind of help them craft their strategies. Um, so I don't mind if, like, I'm the first person that they've ever talked to that's a lawyer. Totally okay. Problem sets in when you get to like that series, like A, or like people who have taken either investor money. Or people have started selling something. Like if you've started selling something in a regulated space and you haven't talked to an attorney, oh God. Like that's just like not good. Like don't ever start selling something in a regulated space without at least talking to one attorney. And I don't even care if it's a regulatory attorney, just an attorney somewhere. So, like it can be your brother's friend from high school, just somebody, you know, somebody who's like, yay or nay that's a bad idea um because unfortunately like i do get pitches from people who are pretty far along and they've never talked to an attorney and you're just it's really hard to craft a good regulatory strategy after you've kind of started marketing something or you started telling you know consumers something or you started telling investors something um it's really hard to put the cat in the bag after something bad has already been said is is it because founders don't know whether they have to get approval from the government for doing certain things, or what? What is the reason? Behind? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot. Of, it's 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 overwhelming. Like, there's especially in the United States, our regulatory structure is all over the place. Like, it's it's hard to figure out like if something applied to you. It's hard to figure out like. I mean, if you're in healthcare, it's hard to figure out, like, what do they want? Like, what do they want to see? Like, that you just know they want a clinical trial, and you're like, well, what do they want the clinical trial to show? Um, I, I think there's that. There's also paired with the, like, there is somewhat of a mindset and a lot of founders and a lot of investors, that, you know, it's that move fast and break things mindset where it's like, we should be able to do this it's gonna help things. And it's like, well, yeah, but there's a big difference between, like, uber upsetting an apple car that is you know the taxi cab industry in new york city that was you know somewhat heavily involved with organized crime already like there were reasons that uber like was not upsetting a bad apple car like they were that they, they were helping a system kind of innovate that needed innovate it was you know the taxi cab and the taxi medallion industry was just i mean honestly a shit show pardon my french but like they they were all they were helping an industry that needed help um and so i think when i see uber as the example of like move fast right things and then it's like you're talking to founders who are building pharmaceuticals so like they're like yeah we're gonna upset the johnson and johnson apple cart and you're like great so don't make these mistakes and they're like no we don't need to where this this shouldn't apply to me too much government overreach and i'm like i do not care what your political leanings are like Unfortunately, regulators are there to help people and to protect people. I I know a ton of regulators, and I don't know a single one that goes into work. And it's like, I'm just trying to make Elon Musk's life harder. I can guarantee you that's not it. They're really just trying to protect people. And I think the lack of understanding that that's what regulators do has caused so much friction between the startup and tech space and regulator like regulators and agencies to the point where, like, you will see startup founders like go after individual regulators like on like social media and like again i don't know any regulator who goes into work every day and is like i'm just trying to make this person's life living hell they don't make enough money for that sh like they don't make enough money they're like they're like dc is a really depressing place like trust me this is not at all like they are there because they actually want to help people and if they didn't they would leave like you you see regulators leave all the time when they're unhappy with their jobs it's a thing so like i i don't like that the perception is just regulators are like out there trying to like hurt the tech industry and hurt innovation that's not the case um i think 
it really does need to be a framing of like, listen, regulators are trying to help people. They are trying to protect people. That is their job. Um, it is just the same way as like an entrepreneur. Your job is to innovate and find ways to, you know, innovate that help people like that. We're all in this together. And so I, I think that's really important. Um, I think the biggest thing too is you see a lot of, a lot of people really do like out of it's whether it's a lack of understanding or it's just a lack of um historical knowledge they don't really understand the agencies and how the agencies work um they think that like they, they just don't understand administrative law to be really honest like the amount of times i i tell people like you need to talk to an administrative lawyer and they're like what's an, an administrative lawyer um so in the united states administrative lawyers pretty are pretty important um they're just very underused. And I, I think most people in tech don't know who they are, where to find one. Um, but they can be really helpful for getting things through and processes approved um, in terms of like really making sure the government understands what you're doing and regulators know what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, and that's really, that's really the biggest thing is like making sure you know, regulators don't need to know everything about your business, but they do need to know the things that can go wrong. Like that's, it's, it's part of risk management, essentially. Yeah. I mean, it's funny that you mentioned the government agencies. I was talking to Tim Draper the other day. Uh, he mentioned somewhat of a similar thing that the problem with FDA uh, is that uh, it takes 15 years and $2 billion to get approved. What causes this problem? Yeah, I mean, if it, if it's something causing like billions of dollars to get through FDA, that it probably shouldn't get through FDA. Um, I, I mean, that's the thing. Like, that's a little concerning. Um, I think we we see a lot of things that kind of if you've messed up, it gets more expensive, um, or if the data doesn't look as good as you might want it to, that'd be more expensive. Why? Well, especially with like biotechs and healthcare, there you do have to do a clinical study. Um, like there has to be multiple clinical studies. You basically have to show this will not kill someone or this will not harm people. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to pay a lot of money or have a lot of people in your studies because the, the data isn't that clear. Um, and that's that's kind of where you do start to see ad comms. So you see committees um, come in that like are a little harsher. Um, they start to dig a little bit deeper on the data and what it means. And each of those committees means you're going to, it adds another year. It adds another year or two. It adds, they're going to ask for more data. They're going to ask to um, have studies where they follow patients after the, like for years. I mean, there are some, um, there's some clinical studies that are ongoing for 10, 20 years and they are long studies. Um, and again, it's, it's because there is a risk and you want to, you don't want to know, like, you don't want to know in like 30 years that your drug ended up causing people to die or started causing harm. Um, there was, you know, in, I think it was in the eighties, there was a pharmaceutical that was given to women help with nausea when they were pregnant so morning sickness just nausea help them keep food down one unfortunately it it ended up coming out a little bit later than people would have liked that the drug was actually causing uh malformed limbs it was causing birth defects in, in babies um but again like we didn't do a lot of studies with pregnant women um so nobody knew what could actually happen if women took this and so that's why we started to see a lot more you know, studies like that, that later we found out something very bad happened. That's why studies now cover a lot more and why they're a lot longer and they are just a lot more intense. Um, we, we've learned from kind of some mistakes in the past where, oops, um, could have probably vetted this a little bit better and, and really saved some lives and, and, you know, prevented some children from having some, some pretty pretty hard things to deal with at birth yeah but, uh, but uh, when these uh, when these government agencies look at your 
product or company what what do the boys really looking for apart from don't kill people <laughs> don't kill people yeah i mean honestly i think it's it they're looking to the first thing that government okay so every time i i talk to a startup I'm like the first thing government agencies are looking for is like how do you manage your own risks like do you know your own risks like do you know the risks to your business the risks to your customers the risks that you're putting out there to other people with your you know whatever your product is um that's first and foremost they want to know that you have an eye on that um because i mean one of the hardest things to do is if you don't know that risks and an agency tells you what it is yeah i, I mean that's not good then <laughs> that's basically them being like hey y'all don't know how to do your job um and when that happens they do tend to dig really hard into kind of looking to your to what you're building um you know you want to you want to come out of the gate and show them that you are the experts at your own product um and unfortunately something i do see is a lot of people are pretty naive they're like we would never do that like i would never like the amount of times i talked to fintech people and i'm like well what's protecting you know a rogue you know team member from doing this we would never hire someone that would do something horrible oh my goodness no uh, okay but that's not like hope springs eternal um but that is not reality unfortunately like you do have to kind of work through that um and i think that kind of also goes against like everything it means to be a founder like when you're a founder you're so optimistic you're like everything's gonna go great we can do this well when you're working in a regulated industry you do have to think about all the things that go wrong and so it's a hard it's just not how your brain works as a founder. And so you do have to kind of reframe it a little bit into like, okay, now I have to be incredibly negative. Um, I think that's also why it's, yeah. let me tell you one of the reasons it's hard to be an investor in regulated industries, because you do have to be like everything that can go wrong, but everything that can go right. And they have to be equally weighed um, because you really can't turn into the person that's like, well, here's all the things that could go wrong. So nothing's ever going to work. Um, things do go right they do go right but you know as a founder you do unfortunately have to think through like all the things that can go wrong um you do need to have pretty decent risk management plans um you have to really think about are you putting processes and procedures in place early enough that with by the time the company scales and grows these risks really are mitigated like your processes and procedures have to grow with you as a company. They can't be like, well, they work for 10 people, but as soon as we hit like 100 people, we don't know what's going on at our company. Um, and I think you see that all the time, especially in in like the recent cases of a lot of startups that have really struggled or they ended up with regulatory issues or um, here in San Francisco, um, you know, Cruz is, is currently in trouble with San Francisco. And, and one of the biggest things is, you know, your company grows to a certain size, it's really hard to keep track of all the safety concerns. And so like, I think they, you know, I, I really hope they can get things back on track. And I think a lot of that is like starting to dig a little bit deeper about like where safety concerns go and how they're monitored. Um, and I think that's really all the city seems to be asking for. So, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities and maybe I'm overly optimistic that people can do that, but, um, I do think it's possible to be responsible as a founder and um, responsible as someone who does have to interact with a regulatory agency um, or the government. Like, I, I think both things are entirely possible. And I think people who are, you know, I want to be a responsible, you know, founder, but I don't want to be responsible to the government. I, I think that's problematic because at the same time, you also don't want to be someone that's Oh, I'm so responsible to the government, but I don't really give a shit about my company. Well, I, I, I mean, it can't be one or the other. You, you have to, you have to work both sides of the same coin here. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we, we do see people who are like who are like that, but should should the founder really put in all the regular regulatory work before actually building the company and going into building the company? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think it's kind of like weighing the risks. So you do need to kind of see what you like, what you can do at each step of your company and how it's going to scale. 
Um, because I do talk to startups who are like so focused on regulatory, and I'm like, why you don't have a product yet? Like, calm down. Like, you actually have to like synthesize and like figure out how to build something. Like, because one of the one of the worst things you can do is be in a regulated space and not actually have built out a product not actually have thought through what a product even looks like but you've started to kind of build in public so this is the biggest danger of building in public it, when you're right in a regulated industry if you say you're going to build something but you have no idea how you're actually going to build it and the government gets wind of it in the united states that's a problem because you'll start to get called before all kinds of committees and you don't even know how you're building this product yet like you just know that it's possible but you're you're hiring some people they're gonna figure it out let's just keep our ideas to ourselves in regulated industries because again like you don't want to have to you don't want to have to start answering questions about a product that is still an idea or like a baby um but again like you should be talking to someone about like okay how do i build this so that that doesn't happen like how do i actually build this product so the agencies can understand what I'm building. They can work with me on what I'm building and they can have faith that I'm not going to hurt people as I'm building. It's like, that's the important thing. Um, it's not so much as like, I'm not saying hi to like what you're doing, but I, I think like if you have an idea and you're just kind of spitballing publicly, too many people are going to fill in the blanks and too many people are going to reach out to regulators and be like, have you heard what X, Y, and Z is doing? And there's, there's no point in having that conversation with a regulator when it's like you, your co-founder in your mom's basement, like not, you're not there yet. You don't give yourselves problems before you have to have them. There'll be enough problems later on as a founder. You don't need to have them right away. Yeah. You, you talked about mentioning the ideas and if a person wants to build in public, uh, so what, what are some industries that are not regulated but could be reg regulated or what 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 industry is regulated when yeah. You're... yeah i mean i will say it's just something that i think is it, it it's it's pounding on the door i i think right now ai is not super regulated it will be ai is about to get very 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 regulated um so one of the worst things i am seeing like let's talk about building in public for ai you see people building in public for ai and they talk about you know data use and they talk about where they're getting their data and you're just like oh no 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 don't put that out there like it, a lot of times like their data isn't coming from sources that like they should be getting data from or legally they're not allowed to get data from that or do people know that's what their their data is being used for um you know I think the biggest thing is people don't understand that like AI regulations are going to include a lot of privacy laws. Um, they do right now. Like there are a lot of privacy laws worldwide that, you know, a lot of people don't understand. And so um, they could be building models based on data that they don't own or they don't have permission to use. Um, and so I think we're seeing that already, but I think AI is getting more and more um, conversations about, you know, what can go wrong. And so how are we regulating it? I think, I don't necessarily know that um, there's not that many government agencies that I think understand AI right now, especially in the United States. Um, I do think that'll change. I think we'll start to see additional regulatory, you know, things pop up just because, again, it, it's it's a new burgeoning tech. It's not something that we're, we're used to. Um, but I do think that this is something that you know, a lot of people are thinking is is unregulated that um, will get regulated very, very, very fast. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I think it'll be it'll be a good thing, but I do think it's going to be harder on founders just because I think a lot of AI founders tend to be technical, um, and so they're just not as familiar with that space. And so I do think that means they're going to have to partner. With the right people to help them get through um what the future looks like for ai regulations yeah it, it, it's funny that you mentioned laws that people don't understand gdpr being one of them oh I, but... <laughs> nobody gets it at all um i, I you know it's it's it, it, it... 
the first thing I tell people to do is I'm like, just read the law and tell me what you think and like ask me questions. Like that's my favorite thing to do as a lawyer is just be like, hey, here's a synthesized version of the law. Read it. Tell me what you think it means. For some reason, they're just like, it means that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're just like, okay, I. this is where uh, context clues and common sense, you learn that not everyone gets it. So, uh, if, if I ask you, I mean, GDPR is one thing which I think almost everyone has to compel with because yeah. Europe is a large continent and if you're not there, where are you? What is GDPR? I'll just ask something which I'm not mentioning here, but I think this would be a little trouble to Yeah, yeah. I, so, I mean, it really is just the laws that kind of govern what you can do with people's data. It's like what you can and can't do with people's data. And... The amount of times you get people who like will see people who, um, you know, have personal information on people and they sell it without really understanding that you don't, you can't do that. Or they'll get an email that, that someone else has given them and they'll be like, oh, I'm going to send them an email. And you're just like, uh, you, that person didn't give you permission to email them. Um, so it's really, I always tell people like put themselves in a consumer's shoes when they're, when they're starting to make business decisions around this. Um, because I mean, how would you feel if you just randomly got an email, like on some list that you're like, I don't know, I, no, I have no idea. Why am I getting an email for like banana trees, like unlimited and I kill every plant in my house. Why would I get that? Um, I also am allergic to bananas. So why, why would I get that? Um, like you, you kind of start to be like, did someone put me on the list? What's going on? Um, you know, I, I think when you're looking at kind of any kind of thing like that, like, again, use common sense, like read the law, use, use your common sense, um, and put yourself in like people's shoes. Like, oh my God, don't, don't, don't do anything stupid that would like, like, okay, we're going to, we're going to have a little story time. Uh, <laughs> So I know someone that has a newsletter um, and they, they had someone, they got a hold of an, an older woman's email who had a lot of money and they were like, I really want her to come on my podcast because I want her to, they're like, I really wanted this person to LP in my fund. Like, great, but you can't do that. You can't just put her on your newsletter. Um, some, they did not listen to me. Um, this poor woman thought they were stalking her. I like, she like thought she had like got a stalker or like someone, or like she had a stalker that was putting her on newsletters. Um, like, like, come on. Like, there's a lot of like things that can happen that you don't know about in other people's worlds. This woman had had a lot of stalkers. So like, if something weird shows up in her inbox, History has changed, like it's trained her to be like, oh God, I have another stalker. So, you know, it's something you do have to kind of think about is like, listen, like you don't know what's going on with consumers, but there's a strong chance they would like their privacy to be respected. So it doesn't matter why, it doesn't matter how, just like respect people's data, respect people's privacy. Like these laws are to prevent some poor old lady from freaking out and thinking she's got a stalker who's like, Signing her up for newsletters of strange people. What should, uh, if you talk about practically, what should the timeline between a company getting its foundation laid versus getting approved? What should that look like for early stage? Yeah, I, mean, I think it depends. I think, I think it also depends on what industry you're in. I think the the biggest thing I would say is once you have started communicating with regulatory agencies um you do need to kind of ask them for like what they think that the timeline is going to be because that they're usually pretty good at gauging that um you know if you're a biotech ask the fda like hey how long do you think this will take because you'll also start to see like hey if, like they're taking longer with our approval that's probably a sign and not everything's great and that we should maybe figure out what's going um, if you're working with, you know, someone like federal and you, you know, know what the, the, the time frames are pretty much set in stone and yours is kind of lagging again, you'll be like, okay, this is, this is something we can like talk about. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the biggest things is 
sometimes things do fall through the cracks. So you do have to kind of keep up with regulators to be like, hey, where are we at with these things? Um, but there's definitely some some ways to kind of finagle it. Unfortunately, like I think it is a give and take with agencies. It's not, you know, timelines aren't something that you can just kind of be like, this is I'm I'm good. I created this out of there because one, that's not a good, it's not good for your investors because they'll be gauging you off of a timeline that's artificial. And like, you're actually not helping yourself because like, if you, if you tell your, your, you know, if you tell your shareholders, if you tell your investors, if you tell your board of directors, like one thing, your all your performance is gauged off that. So you want to make sure that you're, you're setting your own goals correctly um, and your team's goals correctly. I think that Another thing people do is kind of they they do that thing where, like I mentioned before, they're like, well, it took this company that long, so I'm just going to put that down. And you, again, don't know what that journey was for them, and, like, you don't actually know if that was accurate. So, like, find out for yourself. Don't use another company. It's like, hey, another company did this. It, 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 that's what ours is. It's like, that, that's not the case. Um, everyone's unique, and you do have to kind of think through that. Uh, sh- should building the company and dealing with regulation happen asynchronously or um, should you focus on one thing at a time? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're building in a regulated space, you should always be thinking about, you know, what the regulatory strategy is and kind of building. I think you do have to know the regulatory landscape to a certain extent before you can start building something. Um, just because if you build something that is completely flies in the face of what regu- like what regulators will want, you're you're gonna be set back to square one. Um, I don't think that's a that hard of a process. Like you can get an overview pretty easily and be like, okay, I think this is what we can and can't do. Like knowing what you can and can't do is pretty much the place you can start. Um, and kind of once you start to build, you can kind of think about how to avoid the pitfalls that, you know, regulators are looking out for. Um, so yeah, I do think I don't think it's a thing. I think it's kind of parallel, um, you know, always knowing kind of what what the risks are on a regulatory scale for for where you are as a product. Yeah, that, 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 that's a good point. I think a lot of people, they, in everything, not even in regulation in general, but they're raising, if they're raising, they're only raising, they're uh, putting a stop on building. So I think everything should have it bad. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, let, let's say a company d- does get approved. It takes them a lot of money, good lawyer, and <laughs> hopefully no J and J there. It does the government actually uh, is the founder really accountable to the government after that, or are they like on their own? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you're uh, as a founder, especially if you're like on your board, you're. Um, you know, pretty active with the IP, you are probably on the hook for if something does happen. I think that's something that, you know, as a founder, you do usually hold responsibility for the end all be all of what happens with your company. I think look at FTX right now, um, SBS on trial. And, you know, unfortunately, if you're the founder of something or you're the leader of something, the buck does tend to stop with you. Um, And so you can't really avoid personal life cases like a lot of people think they can they're like oh we're a c-corp it's fine but it's like if something criminal or something does come about that harms people uh consumers clients investors there's a chance that you know criminal investigations usually will end up encompassing founders yeah 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 ftx what are your thoughts on the ftx like, don't do fraud like oh my god like don't do fraud just like please don't do crime anyone i like if i can just tell anyone anything i'm just like why did we think this was a good idea and the funny thing is both of his parents i had to read their textbooks in law school so this has been incredibly painful like as a lawyer you're just like what did i learn like who did i learn from <laughs> like oh my god no 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 these are people that lawyers like we base it like as a all my tax law like in like every tax law textbook is like partly written by his father and they're like his mom supposedly like an expert in legal ethics and you're just like 
oh no oh no 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 yeah that's a good thing don't be if she ex be anything good um i think don't do that like as as a lawyer i mean wh- wh- why do you deny people doing bad things how, how do lawyers really get the money that everyone stop every everyone is good i okay so um i think everyone is capable of good and bad i think i i, I just think that's how i view philosophically individuals i think everyone is capable of very good things and i think everyone is capable of very very bad things and i think my job as a lawyer is to figure out enough of like if there's a little bit of psychology here it's like how do i figure out enough about someone's internal motivations to fight off any urge they might possibly have to do anything bad so some people you know it's like scare them like hey you could go to jail and here's what jail is some people it's they they have such a like a sense of fairness so they have a sense of you know good they they want to be the good pe- people or like they want to be known as a good person like you just have to figure out what about that individual is going to make them do the right thing versus doing the bad thing which i mean the reasons people do bad things are, are, are there's a litany of reasons for it you know sometimes it's because it's an easy out like they need money fast they don't want to deal with a problem I and mean, sometimes very good people do very bad things so we know this this is this is human behavior it has happened for time immemorial just because someone does something bad doesn't mean they're a bad person but also just because someone is you know again like there's flips of that um and so i think a good lawyer does try and you know you want to make the right choice the correct choice the choice that that person sees no all or like you want them to see no alternative to that choice and that's your job as an attorney um and you can either do it well or unfortunately you can have them go down another pathway um which i think that's a different way than people most people think about attorneys but like getting people to make the right choice is important it's an important part of your job um especially for me i don't touch criminal law if you call me in the middle of the night and tell me the fbi is at your house i'm gonna hang up on you and i'm gonna say good luck um FBI is not at my house, so sucks to be you. Like, not my problem. Not my problem. You knew not to do bad things, and you did bad things. Um, this is this is just one of those things where it's like, unfortunately, there are consequences to our actions, and you can either take those consequences seriously, or you can end up like FGI. Yeah, yeah. This, this is incredible. I think on that note. um don't be ftx don't be bad <laughs> don't do crime yeah <laughs> yeah that that definitely way on the uh, thumbnail for this one uh but no, what advice would you like to give to all the young builders young founders young people out there? apart from don't be yeah. ftx don't be FTX. yeah just don't be ftx so i think the biggest thing is like i see a lot of people that specifically don't build in regulated industries because they're like scared they're like, it's too much work it's going to be too expensive that's the wrong way to look at it if you have an idea like you will find the right partners who can make things happen um big weird crazy ideas happen every day in regulated industries um and so like there's nothing to stop you and your idea from being the one that like works versus all the other ideas that like come about that also work i i mean you know what it just takes the right person with the right idea the right passion and the right team and if you are that passionate about like something or you have that you know that drive and you you're that person to build that thing and i really wish that people understood that because i get a lot of people who are like oh this is going to be too hard so i'm just going to go build something in saas and i'm like but that could be really cool <laughs> uh, i mean that's the thing is like and and i i say this even to myself every once in a while i think back to my own founder experience and i was like oh i wish i had started and built something like super easy like b2b saas versus a genetic company it would have been so easier but as much as i i i want the easy way out and eventually b2b saas can just be just as challenging as a regulated industry and so um i feel like regulated startups just get all their hard stuff out quicker and i think it actually makes them stronger founders over 
you know, they're scaling time, you know, as they scale, I just think they're, they're better leaders and they, they just, they're more mature and they, they know what they're working with because they've had to, they've had to see a lot. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that's an incredible point. Um, that's it from my side and don't be FTX. Anything you'd like to say? Yeah. I think that's, if that's all people will get out of this, then we've done our job. Yeah, for sure. This one. This is so much fun. Uh,